Good afternoon, everyone. We'll wait a few minutes for Maura to join. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll wait a few more minutes for others to join us, and then we'll get started. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our seventh webinar in the Caring for Caregivers series. I'm Sandra Harris, State President of AARP Massachusetts, and I'm honored to be today's moderator. Before I begin, I'd like to share some background on this webinar series. Launched as a partnership with the Executive Office of Elders Affairs, Mass Home Care, and the Massachusetts Technology Collaborative in May of 2021, we at ARP are honored to join in as a collaborator in today's series. The purpose of the caregiving seminar is to provide simple tips, practical solutions, and information on community resources to support family caregivers throughout the Commonwealth. Our goal is to bring together caregivers to learn more about topics of interest with each webinar focusing on a different facet of caregiving. Today's theme is Alzheimer's, its impact on the Black community, on brain health, and preventive measures we can all take in navigating all of these as caregivers. Here's a brief overview of today's agenda. We're pleased to have several distinguished panelists. First is Stephanie Monrold, Director of Equity and Access and Executive Director of African Americans Against Alzheimer's, a network of us against Alzheimer's, a national advocacy organization based in Washington, DC. Stephanie will share information on the impact of Alzheimer's and health disparities on communities of colors and the importance of all communities, especially those most at risk to adopt risk reduction strategies and promote brain health and healthy living. Next is David Parks. David is policy advisor in ARP's Policy Research and International Affairs Division. David also serves as a project manager for the Global Council on Brain Health, an independent collaborative of scientists, doctors, and policy experts convened by ARP to provide trusted information on brain health. David will share the work ARP is doing in this space and share the six pillows of brain health. And because we learn so much from and value the voices of caregivers, we've invited Robin Tucker to join this conversation. Robin will share her experience of caring for her mother who was living with Alzheimer's. Robin just retired last week. So congratulations, Robin, and welcome. Lastly, we're here from Donna Murray, the Family Caregiving Support Specialist at Bay Path Elder Services. Bay Path offers home care and related services enabling people to live independently and comfortably in their homes. Donna is a certified dementia practitioner and she will discuss the resources that are available to caregivers and their loved ones in Massachusetts. After hearing from our panel, we'll take a few questions from you and then close with information about other caregiving resources. But before starting, here's some quick housekeeping and tech logistics. If you are joining us live today, you can engage in the conversation throughout the event by posting your thoughts on social media by tagging us at hashtag mass caregivers. You can use the chat function to ask questions of our panelists and the close 
the bottom of your screen can be disabled at any time. And lastly, a link to today's recordings will be sent to you. So Stephanie, welcome. Let's get this started. Well, thank you so much. It's indeed my great pleasure to um, be with you all today to talk about Alzheimer's disease. Um, I've been working in this space for um, going on uh, 12 years. Um, it was interesting to me as I began working in the Alzheimer's space that three years into it, my father uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And so I live um, and breathe the world of policy and trying to address Alzheimer's and make sure that African-Americans have the information that we need um, to be able to make strong caregiving um, and health decisions. Um, and also I'm a caregiver for my dad. So uh, both perspectives I, I'm able to, to bring to the table. Next slide, please. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease um, is a type of dementia. We think about dementia as a broad umbrella. And underneath that, there are different types of Alzheimer's disease. And it's important to know what type you have because the treatment um, and the characteristics will change. Um, there are roughly five different types of Alzheimer's disease, which include Lewy bodies, frontal temporal, vascular dementia, mixed dementia, and then Alzheimer's, which is 75% of all types of, dis of Alzheimer's disease, of all types of dementia disease. disease. Alzheimer's is a progressive disease, um, which means there's currently not a cure for it. Um, it will progress um, uh, uninterrupted at, at currently um, through uh, early stage um, to an end stage of the disease, which can take um, sometimes 20 years or so to go through the entire um, process. Um, it's a disease that uh, leads to the ability, inability to carry on conversation potentially, uh, to be able to participate in activities of daily living. Um, and again, this is, uh, can be gradual. Um, of course, we all know that memory loss is a significant part of the disease, um, but part of that memory loss is not remembering sometimes how to swallow, um, not remembering exactly how to walk. You often see uh, people who are um, beginning this pathway change in their gait um, and the way that they walk. We often refer to this as like the old man shuffle. Um, and it can seriously affect the person's ability to carry out um, daily activities such as uh, feeding and knowing how to dress appropriately and um, you know, eating and, and swallowing. Next slide. Next slide, please. Alzheimer's increases with age, but it's not a normal part of aging. And that's really important. As we begin to see memory changes, um, we need to make sure that we're keeping our doctors aware of those things. And as caregivers, we're often the ones to report that we see people around us who are having these types of changes. Um, and we need to go to the doctors because the treatments that are currently available for Alzheimer's worst work most effectively for individuals who are diagnosed early in the disease. One out of every eight individuals over the age of 65 has an Alzheimer's disease and nearly half of individuals over age 85 have Alzheimer's. Next slide, please. Alzheimer's is the only leading cause of death that is still on the rise. In fact, about a 75% increase um, over the last 10 years as what we've been experiencing with Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. By 2030, nearly 40% of Americans living with Alzheimer's will be Latino or African-American. And that's why it's important for us to understand both the causes, the treatments, and things that we can actually do to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Next slide. It's also important because it helps us understand um, the conditions that people face when they're also facing Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease is a health disparity for African-Americans and Latinos, where African-Americans are at least twice as likely to have Alzheimer's as non-Hispanic whites. Not coincidentally, we're also more likely to have stroke, more likely to be obese, more likely to die from heart disease, and 72% more likely to be diabetic. All of these we believe are impacting our likelihood to develop Alzheimer's disease 
but they're also things that are very important to manage um, as we enter um, that type of, uh, of an ailment. So currently in the United States, we have 6.2 million Americans who've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and 1.1 million are African Americans. That's important because we are roughly 13% of the population, but representing over 20% of people who have Alzheimer's disease. It's the sixth leading cause of death for all Americans and the fourth leading cause of death for older African Americans. And over 16 million Americans provide 18.6 billion hours of unpaid care for people living with Alzheimer's valued at nearly $244 billion. So the burden on caregiving is extremely um, profound, both financially, emotionally, and physically. Um, caregivers needing to recognize that they're in fact in a care position, which is sometimes a challenge for African-Americans who believe if they are the daughter, the son, the child of a person living with Alzheimer's, they don't see themselves often as a caregiver. They're just a child, parent, or a loved one and providing care for their loved one. So only until we acknowledge that we are in fact caregivers, even long distance caregivers, will we be able to understand and seek support that's needed by us, by caregivers. Next slide, please. The economic impact of, of Alzheimer's is also very pronounced. Next slide, please. Alzheimer's, African-Americans, I'll just say that make up about 13% of the population, but we bear over 33% of the costs of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. And most of these costs are caregiving costs. Um, those are the costs that are incurred for most of the progress of the disease. Um, managing comorbidities, of course, is covered by some health insurance by Medicare. And then later in stages, other um, issues um, be, be, be need, need, are in need of treatment. Um, we're driving some of the economic medical costs of people falling and and other issues that would uh, land them potentially in the hospital. So the economic burden on Alzheimer's um, is significant. In 2012, it was 71.6 billion. We're expecting those costs to, to triple, and they are in fact tripling. Um, these costs are expected to more than double from today to 2050. And caregiving represents the bulk of that cost, accounting for more than 60%. Most of these costs are borne by women because 60% of Alzheimer's patients are in fact women and also 60% of Alzheimer's caregivers happen to be women. And we also can see on a maps that Alzheimer's disease is centered, concentrated in Southern states, um, in the East Coast and uh, some of the um, West Coast states, Los Angeles and Texas, for example. African-Americans between age 40 and 64, where they are caring for a loved one, um, lost about $6.1 billion in labor market productivity due to Alzheimer's disease, mostly from lost wages. The projected cost, next page, next slide, please. The projected cost of Alzheimer's uh, from 2012 to 2050, um, you can see through this slide that the purple represents caregiving costs, and those are the bulk of costs. Lost productivity is in the green. Nursing home, adult care, and assisted living costs is next in red, and then the medical care costs follow. Next slide. So we've been look, understanding Alzheimer's disease, and we've been understanding some of the causes of Alzheimer's disease. Um, of course, we know that brain changes can often begin about 20 years before a person may begin to um, show symptoms of the disease. We're learning so much more about Alzheimer's disease with really intentional um, research that's being done at academic hospitals, um, schools across the United States, um, and by research enterprises. One of the things that we are beginning to understand better is how poverty may be increasing Alzheimer's risk, and also how the neighborhood um, may be increasing Alzheimer's risk. It's important that we, as we're building infrastructure in neighborhoods um, and in certain areas, that we make sure that they have access to quality health care, um, prevention strategies, neurologists, and others, as this population, the elderly population, is a, the a highest growth area in terms of population indexes um, across the United States. We have to know that we're prepared to do that. And not just 
um, access to health care, but these other things that we talk about in terms of social determinants of health, which is educational opportunities, clean environment, um, places to get out and exercise, um, healthy foods, et cetera, that those all contribute to brain health, brain health promotion, which really begins at birth and continues through the continuum. So I did a little bit of pulling in terms of uh, the Massachusetts statistics. Next slide, please. And we found that in, Ma um, in Massachusetts, we have about 130,000 people living with Alzheimer's disease back in 2018. That number increased from 2.5% uh, in 2016 to 8.27% in 2018. 62% of people with Alzheimer's in Massachusetts are women. Um, and 12.8% are Black. Unpaid caregivers, however, are 337,000. And that number, again, with the number of people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, will continue to grow. So here's an actual map. We have partnered with an organization called the National Minority Quality Forum and created a National Alzheimer's Disease Index, which allows us to visualize Alzheimer's disease um, in states, in communities, and actually down to a zip code level uh, to see where people who are living with Alzheimer's live. And that's important to use data to help, you know, if we see pockets or hot spots of people living in certain areas, we can be very intentional about making sure um, that they have the resources that they need in that particular community to be able to address folks that they're seeing. So on this map, and I apologize, it's not as large as we would like it. You can see the Commonwealth um, and in, the, in the top middle area of Massachusetts. Um, the yellow um, is in, are the areas that have only between one and 6.4% of individuals with, with Alzheimer's. If you look down and you see the darker areas, there's a higher rate of Alzheimer's disease. Um, the darkest one being bottom right-hand corner where it's between um, close to 10% to 23%. Next slide, please. We're also able to look at this disease through a lens of where the African-Americans are living in the Commonwealth who also have Alzheimer's disease. And so again, you'll see, unlike the previous map, the upper left-hand quadrant um, are where um, there's a high density of African-Americans with Alzheimer's disease. And again, the, the darker the colors, that's where the density is. So if we make sure that we've got the right services, that we're bringing in caregiver supports, um, that we're make, raising awareness, that we're equipping physicians with what they need to diagnose appropriately, and that we're letting people know what, what Alzheimer's disease might look like as it's beginning early and how we can prevent it in those communities and targeting those communities that are most at risk uh, will be very important. And that's it for me. Back to you, Sandra. Thank you so much, Stephanie. This information is so critical to our community and our caregivers. David, you're next. All right, well, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, and many thanks to the Massachusetts Caregiving Initiative, our partners and colleagues uh, for participating in this event. I'm really excited to be with all of you to talk uh, a bit about brain health. Um, so I think this will be a good segue um, from Stephanie's presentation, I'll be providing a, you know, a, rel a relatively brief but uh, hopefully informative presentation on uh, AARP six pillars of brain health. So you know, everyday uh, simple actions we can take uh, to help protect our brain health. Next slide, please. So with that, um, let's start with the good news. Um, and that is uh, cognitive decline is not inevitable as we age. So until recently, experts believed that at birth, um, our brains had all the cells that we were ever going to have. Uh, but based on recent research, um, our brain is constantly changing. Regardless of age, uh, we can make new ner uh, nerve cells. Uh, we can take charge of our brain health, improve our quality of life. Um, experts actually say that only about 30% of aging uh, can be traced to our genes. Uh, the rest is up to lifestyle choices. Uh, next slide, please. So knowing that um, AARP has developed uh, the six pillars of brain health. So I'll be again providing, uh, covering each of these uh, relatively briefly one by one, just to preview uh, the six pillars here are be social, engage your brain, manage stress, 
ongoing exercise, restorative sleep, eat right. Um, and as you can see, we use uh, this Be More acronym um, as a useful way to remember these. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the first pillar of brain health is staying uh, socially engaged. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, studies suggest that uh, those who have um, good social networks uh, live longer. Um, they're physically and mentally healthier uh, than people who are socially isolated. Um, connecting with other people uh, stimulating adds meaning purpose to our lives. Uh, there was a recent study uh, by AARP Foundation uh, with the National Academies. It found that there are health risks um, associated with loneliness. Uh, a quite serious one um, is that social isolation was associated with about um, a 50% increased risk of dementia. So again, a 50% increased risk of dementia was uh, associated with social isolation. Quite a serious finding. Uh, next slide, please. So what can you do uh, to stay socially engaged? If you're looking for ideas, I encourage you all here uh, to check out our new resource guide. It's called Boosters for Joy. This guide was uh, designed to help adults connect safely, particularly during COVID. I know uh, the country is starting to open up again, but you know this guide still offers uh, you know a lot of useful resources, over a hundred um, videos, events, uh, volunteer opportunities, podcasts, arts activities, really a wealth of information to help boost social connections. The guide is, is free, available on our website, uh, www.globalcouncilonbrainhealth.org. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our second pillar is engaging your brain. So discovering, learning new things. Next slide, please. Um, studies have shown a lot of positive effects of, of challenging the brain in new ways throughout our life. Um, our brain is stimulated, makes new connections. Uh, when we learn new things and pursue new interests. Uh, next slide. So just some suggested activities, um, teaching, uh, taking a class, um, you know, even virtually, especially uh, during COVID over the past couple of years, a lot of new opportunities in, in the virtual space, uh, learning a new language or dance, playing uh, or learning a musical instrument, doing uh, complex arts and crafts, uh, reading, you know, perhaps a new uh, genre of book you haven't uh, checked out before, uh, playing a challenging card or board game, just, just some ideas here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, right, so our third pillar is managing stress, uh, especially important uh, during these difficult, uh, turbulent times. Next slide, please. So um, managing stress would include things like regular exercise, um, it, helping to relieve uh, the mental and physical effects of stress. I'll be talking a bit more about exercise here um, just momentarily. Smiling and laughing uh, releases hormones, brain chemicals uh, to help balance the effects of stress. Distracting yourself with music or reading, kind of shifting you away from ne negative thoughts. Also try to seek out green spaces, spending time outdoors, enjoying nature, getting some fresh air. Limiting screen time, I know that can be difficult um, in this virtual world, but do uh, give your mind regular moments of rest. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so moving along, our fourth pillar, a uh, fourth pillar is ongoing exercise. You know, this doesn't have to be, uh, you know, becoming a marathon runner. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just recommendations, uh, pretty simple recommendations on exercise, getting at least 150 minutes of exercise each week. That's about two and a half hours of total, about 30 minutes on most days. Walking, always a good way uh, to start. Beyond uh, you know, the physical, exercise has many benefits uh, for brain health. Research has uh, suggested that being physically active helps repair, protect chemicals in the brain, increase circulation, reduce anxiety and stress, um, kind of complementing what I just talked about the, the, on, on the stress pillar, improving our sleep, and, and most importantly, reducing the risk of diabetes, heart disease, depression, and stroke. Uh, next slide, please. Some ways to get active, uh, like I said, you know, taking regular walks. Um, you can build some, if you feel a bit more confident, more moderate intensity uh, aerobic exercise, dancing, running, hiking, biking, uh, strength training, if you're able um, to help strengthen uh, the muscles. Tai Chi, yoga uh, can work on balance, flexibility, strength as well. Um, I imagine reduce stress. Uh, again, complementing that, that previous pillar. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next up is restorative sleep, our fifth pillar. Uh, simply put, sleep restores the brain. Um, sleep is vital to support our brain health. And next slide, please. So start by getting enough sleep. Uh, us adults typically need seven to eight hours in a 24-hour period. 
um, practicing good sleep, uh, sleep techniques. Um, I'll cover a bit more in the next slide as well. Uh, maintaining a regular sleep schedule though, get up at the same time, uh, try to every day, seven days a week. Um, but it is important to note there are changes to sleep um, as folks age. So sleep is more easily interrupted as you age. Uh, deep sleep tends to decrease between the ages of 30 to 60 years. Uh, the body's internal clock shifts too. So staying up later becomes more difficult. Uh, might find yourself waking up earlier in the morning, but those are a normal part of aging. Uh, we stress, don't worry too much about an occasional bad night of sleep. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, those kind of practical recommendations to help get a better sleep, adjust the caffeine intake beginning after lunch, try to avoid caffeine, keeping pets or anything else uh, out of the bedroom that might disturb sleep, uh, restricting fluids, foods three hours before uh, going to bed, keeping the room cool. Uh, and again, it's always difficult, but keeping smartphones, TVs, electronics out of the bedroom, uh, reducing light exposure um, helps prior uh, to sleep. Uh, next slide, please. So our sixth and final pillar is eating right. Always an interesting topic uh, because what you eat also has a big impact on your brain, uh, studies have shown. Uh, next slide, please. So you've probably heard of, of various diets, nutrition plans out there. You know, for example, like the, the Mediterranean diet, it's a popular one. Um, but really the bottom line is that no specific diet has been proven to maintain or improve brain health. Um, however, there is evidence out there to support um, eating fewer sweets, um, less meats, uh, particular like processed meats, uh, also processed desserts, especially those uh, that contain uh, trans fats recommended to avoid. Um, on the other hand, uh, try and consume more fish, nuts, uh, beans, grains, leafy green, vegetables, healthy fats, um, such as olive oil. Uh, next slide, please. Other examples of brain healthy foods uh, to consider adding, uh, serving your plate with vegetables, uh, kale, spinach, broccoli, eating berries, whole berries, fresh, frozen, canned um, are all okay. Uh, using vinegar, lemon, herbs, spices uh, for flavor instead of uh, salt. Uh, I know it's always, uh, tempting to reach for that, that salt, uh, the salt shaker, but um, do try and maybe incorporate more of those uh, natural like herbs, spices instead. Uh, eating more fish like salmon, um, and don't forget uh, nuts, uh, walnuts, almonds, uh, also make for a great snack during the day. And next slide, please. Some, some resources um, are available through the Global Council on Brain Health. Um, all of this is free. Um, you don't have to be an AARP member. Um, so to date, um, the Global Council, we published a total of um, about a dozen, 11 different reports um, exploring a, a range of brain health topics. I, I covered the six pillars of brain health, um, but there are others, uh, for example, like music. Uh, one of our more recent reports is looking um, at how music in, uh, affects the brain, how music can be used um, as a mechanism to help, um, in, you know, maintain our brain health, um, improve mental well-being. Um, for each of these reports, we publish an infographic. It's kind of like a, a bite-sized version of the report um, if you don't want to read uh, the entire thing. But again, all of this is available on our website for free, uh, globalcouncilonbrainhealth.org. And next slide. I think that's my final slide here. Um, thanks everyone for listening in. Um, our contact email is listed here, uh, gcbh at aarp.org if you have any follow-up questions. But I believe, um, like we said, we'll have some time for Q&A as well after our next speakers. Looking forward. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. This is really great information. And I, I remind you, our audience, to include any questions that you may have for Stephanie, uh, David, or any of, of our other panelists in the chat. And now on to Robin, our caregiver. Welcome, Robin. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And, um, to David, thank you for that information. That's very good information, appreciate that. Hi, my name is Robin. I am the mother of two. I have 12 grandkids and actually as of last night, I had my eighth great grandchild born last night. <laughs> so we're still growing. So I do, I care for my mother who's, um, she's 97 years old. And she was actually just diagnosed, maybe it's probably been about four or five years since she's, when, when she was first diagnosed that we really realized something was going on with her. But um, it's been a journey learning how to care for her. Um, fortunately, 
we do have uh, joining townhouse condos, which makes my life easier that she's right next door, that I can take care of her right there. And as a caregiver, it's, it's nice to be able to have that space where you get frustrated, I can step away for five or 10 minutes and then go right back because she's right there. Um, I just recently retired after 45 years of working. I've worked in human resources benefits for 45 years um, at Raytheon Company. So now I have more time to give to her, to my mother, but I also have a person who comes in, who comes in twice a week to help me out. So that because I'm working, and even though people assume that you're living right next door, you can just be there all the time. If you're working, you can't. So it's been great having that person right next door to me. And that comes over and she can be there to take care of her for about five hours out the day. And as a retired person, I'm still going to maintain that of having her come because I still need to have my time, you know. So she will still come in. She gladly will come in and care for her with me. Um, it's, um, there's just so many stories you could tell about caring for, you know, it, you see your loved one that's changing, this person who was so independent and now they lose their independence. You're seeing that. And like when I had to take her car, so even though with her dementia, she still knows that I took her car and she tells everyone, she sold my car. <laughs> so that still bothers her that she can't get out and go when she would normally be able to go. If the sun is out shining, she'd be out for a ride and she can't do that. So, you know, she loses that independence. But I make sure I do take her out two or three times out the week and we just go ride and ride, which makes her feel better. Um, and I think, it, you know, the activity of just seeing it, she doesn't get out the car, but she does get to see people and see the, the trees is her favorite thing to see. And although we may go out at 10 o'clock in the morning, and come back seven at night, Sometimes she'll tell me she's not getting out the car because she's not ready to go in the house. <laughs> so I have literally let her sit in the car with the radio playing for a little while before I take her in. But um, it's, I try to stay on top of trying to find what resources are available. Like in, in, unfortunately due to COVID and pandemic, I had her going to the senior center because they had a, a program there called the, um, is a cafe for people with dementia, but then that shut down. So now we don't have that. And that the memory cafe is what it was called at the senior center in Worcester. So hopefully stuff like that will open up again. So you can have an avenue to take them where they can interact with other people and also give yourself that break. Um, but it's a lot, she's still pretty much independent as far as like taking care of herself hygiene. She doesn't like she doesn't like help with that. So she gets up every morning and she will make up her bed. She wants to go in and get herself cleaned up and get herself dressed. Although my um, person that comes in, we have a set day that we tell her you have to have the help on this day, like to take her shower and stuff because I can't let her try that on her own because um, and one of you had mentioned earlier about losing the, the their footsteps change. I'm seeing that the that, that gait changing, the shuffle. So she, it's kind of unsafe for her to try to go in there and do a shower. So we help her with those kinds of things. And then I had to put railings all around the walls in her house that you know that she can hold on to. And we have two floors, so I put in a chair lift so she can safely go up and down the stairs. And I have cameras all over the house so I can see her as she's moving if I'm in my house. Although one of my great granddaughters told me that I'm a spy. She said, you're spying on her, that's not fair. So I explained to her that it's a safety thing. I'm not spying, I'm just making sure she's safe. Then we had to remove all the burners from out the stove because the stoves are, are electric because then she was in there cooking one day and. She called me and told me this noise is going off in the house and it's the smoke alarms, but she didn't even connect, even though the house was full of smoke even. So I had to do things like that, take out the burners and do a lot of cooking here and take it over to her. Um, but it's, it's, 
it's just so different. No one can really understand it until you've lived it. it um, that day to day of caring with some for someone in that condition and just seeing that change. It's you have those days where you get frustrated and you're like, what? Why can't they do this? Why can't they? It, you know, it could be the simplest thing. It's like, why is it taking so long? You know, so you have to stop and say, okay, this is what's happening with this dementia. But um, you know, I, like I said, the, their personalities start to change. Like, just this newfound love for vanity, for vanity, the way she talks sometimes. It's like, oh my goodness, you have to watch what they're gonna say. You know. Um, but you know, it's it's all part of it. You have to just just learn to work with it every day and try try different things. I've just ordered memory board games for her, which those have helped out. I've even had to buy special type of shoes so she can put her shoes on without a problem, which makes it easier for me when she is getting dressed that I know she can slip those shoes on and not worry about it. Um, it's just there's just so much, but at least for me, in our situation, I have my family nearby, so they come and help out. All the grandsons, granddaughters, they all. I even had a grandson, you know, he, he helps with everything. He has no problem. If she, it's, he spent the night one night and she had an accident, he got her up, changed her bed, got her dressed and cleaned up. So it's, that is huge, you know. So I didn't have to get them to go over there and do it. But you know he doesn't have a problem helping with that, so that's a good thing that we do have that. that I I have that kind of help. But um, her eating habits have changed. She likes only certain foods, and then she has a way of creating her own meals. Like her favorite meal seems to be vegetable soup. She'll put vegetables. She'll open up a can of vegetable soup, then she'll put in some cheddar cheese. Then she'll put in some uh, sweet and sour sauce and she crumbled up some Oreo cookies on top of it. Mm. I was like, God, this doesn't seem too healthy. <laughs> she wanted to eat it. But needless to say, I, I talked out of that one and threw it out, which she thought I was wasting the food, but it's okay. She'll be all right. So, you know, it's just a lot of different things you have to learn in just be prepared every day for the change and just do, do the best you can do. That's, that's all we can do is do the best we can do with it. And, and prayerfully, it, it, you know, it helps me to remind myself of what I need to do to hopefully, because we don't really know, is this genetic? Um, is it just a you know, part of nature? It's just gonna change. So we have to start trying to take care of ourselves to be sure you know, hopefully you won't end up with dementia or Alzheimer's. But this is great that these programs are going on that people can find out the mm -hmm. resources and, and, and to know you're not alone. You're not alone with it. Thank you so much, Robin, for sharing your story and for the loving care you're providing your mother. Donna, we thank welcome you. you. Would you like to get started? Yes, thank you, Sandra. And thank you, Robin. I could, I'm sitting here agreeing with you. These are like my conversations with my caregivers. Yeah. So taking, you know, taking care of your loved one can be very rewarding, but it can be quite challenging as most often the responsibilities live on, land on one individual, either by choice or default. Taking on the full weight of your loved one's care can take its toll even on the strongest of caregivers. That's why it's imperative for families and caregivers to build a care team and form a, a circle of support around you. So how do you do that? My recommendation is that you reach out and you start early. Reach out to your local ASAP, and ASAP stands for Aging Service Access Point. ASAPs are private nonprofit agencies that receive state funding, primarily through the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. Bay Path Elder Services, my agency is just one example of an ASAP within the state. The ASAPs have information departments dedicated to collecting and distributing local information and resources for elders who are over the age of 60 or anyone with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. They, 
Um, the information for referral department can provide information on the different programs within the agencies and discuss services. And if there's a fee or a co-payment, the ASAPs have programs that can provide direct services such as Meals on Wheels, homemakers, personal care workers, companions, home health aides, food shopping, laundry assistance, payments for adult day health centers, transportation, personal emergency response buttons, you know, everyone knows the lifeline, um, medication blister packs, or even medication machines. We have case managers that can help you problem solve and figure out the services that you need and also help connect you to community services. Other programs within the ASAP are options counseling, which is a free service. That, that service can help you if you're caring for somebody living with a disability and you're looking for long-term services and support. The family caregiver program that I work in, that's my program, is a free program also. It's for adult caregivers who are caring for somebody over the age of 60. If you're caring for an individual with a dementia, we also have a grandparent kinship program. So if you're over 55 and you're caring for a child under 18 or someone who's disabled, we can help. The caregiver support specialist can provide individual consultation, support, and connect you to the resources that you need. One of the most important topics we bring up is self-care, only because when we first help ourselves, can we effectively help others? Caring for yourself is one of the most important and one of the most often forgotten things you can do as a caregiver. When your needs are taken care of, you can care for the, the person you're caring for will benefit too. Some resources for self-care may include joining a caregiver support group, taking a caregiver class, so there's classes specific to somebody with a dementia, if you're caring for someone with a dementia called Savvy Caregivers. There's also powerful tools, which is more of a general caregiving class uh, where they teach you the tools that you need to care for the person and also to take care of yourself. We'll ask, do you need some respite services? As we all need to take a break, we all need the ability to change our focus and time to recharge. As David mentioned, are you connecting, you know, are you being social? Are you connecting to others? And are you able to use the six pillars? I was taking notes because those are so important, eating, sleeping, exercise, connecting with others. So since we all need socialization for good brain health, can we help you connect your loved one to an adult day health center who may offer a half day or a full day program? They are wonderful at overcoming some of the challenges that may concern you. As a caregiver, do you need services for yourself? Do you need technology? Is your housing secure? Are you a caregiver living in poverty? Those are some of the questions we ask. Please reach out to your ASAP, who will work with you to connect to services and resources directly in your community. So this is new, hot off the press. EUEA has developed a new website resource for people living with dementia and their caregivers. The website link has not yet been disseminated, but it is live and certainly ready for use. The website incorporates feedback from caregivers and EOEA is co currently collecting feedback from persons living with dementia. And I believe Molly will put this link. She has a link now in the chat. Thank you, Molly. So you're probably wondering, how do you locate your local ASAP? There's an organization called Mass Options. Mass Options is a service of the Massachusetts Executive Office of Health and Human Services to assist elders and anyone living with a disability seeking options to long-term ser services and support. It's a free service. They will help you locate your ASAP and any other necessary agency through a network of providers and state agencies. They also can help you if you're looking for a resource out of state, if you're a long distance caregiver. One really important resource is the Alzheimer's Association of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. That's our local chapter. It's free. They have a 24 hour, seven day a week 
helpline staffed with master level clinicians. And this chapter also has local care consultants. A care consultant can go more in depth than the helpline on care planning, access to specialists, activities, connecting to your family caregiver specialist, connecting to your ASAP also. The Alzheimer's Association can provide you with the most up-to-date research, information such as what is dementia? Do you know the 10 signs? What are the different types of dementia? As you may need different strategies and caring for your loved one. They also have caregiver support groups specific to caregivers that are taking care of somebody with a dementia. Our local chapter just announced that they will be returning to in-person events in April. So we're so lucky. So we're starting to see some of the virtual resources come in person, but they will continue to offer some virtual resources. It is gonna take a little bit of an adjustment. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to single out and Robin had mentioned this are the memory cafes. The memory cafes are comfortable social gatherings that allow people experiencing memory loss and their loved ones time to connect, to socialize, and to build a support network. The cafes may be held at your local senior center or a local establishment with entertainment and refreshment. They usually last around an hour and a half, time for you to listen to the entertainment, partake, and then time to connect with other uh, family members. I, had, I was very fortunate this past Monday, I was able to attend a memory cafe that started up again in person in Marlboro at the La Choux Cafe. They had a man playing guitar and he was singing, everybody was singing and dancing and it was a really nice event. So I encourage everybody on this, professionals too, to check out a local memory cafe. They're fantastic, so please join in. So reach out to your local ASAP, reach out to your family caregiver specialist. We're here to, to assist you. And thank you for letting me participate today. Thank you so much, Donna, for your comments and for all the good you and your ASAP colleagues are doing in our community. I now welcome back all of the panelists for questions and answers. And I do see that we already have a few questions. So let's get that started. Donna, I think this one may be good for you. What would you recommend I do first if I am feeling tired and overwhelming and I need a break? So I, the first thing I would recommend is not to isolate, to reach out. Sometimes I talk to caregivers and I just say, what are you feeling? What are the emotions you're dealing with? How can we help connect you? So again, reach out to your mass options if you need to know what you know, where your local agency is located, they can connect you to your ASAP. You can connect with your local council on aging, reach out, take a step. We are not gonna force anything, it's no pressure. Family caregiver specialists will just help educate you on what some of your options are and help you get connected. Thank you so much. Robin, what is the most important thing for you as a caregiver? Uh, the most important thing thing to me is remembering to take care of myself and to not feel guilty when I can't do everything I want to do to help. Because there are times that you feel like, oh, I feel bad because I got frustrated and I may have snapped, um, but we're human too. So it's, I think it's, for me, it's, it's also just remembering to, in as Donna just said, to reach out for the other services that are available and to people that are willing to help you. But to remember to take care of myself in it because you are doing the best you can do. Yeah, that's very, very important. Um, David, for you, what advice would you give someone who's just starting on their six pillars of brain health journey? Yes, that's always a, a common question that we get, you know, where, where do I even start? Um, one of our main uh, pieces of advice is, is to start small. Um, so I would recommend picking, you know, just one thing that you can do. Um, you or a loved one, uh, perhaps just focusing on, on one of those six pillars of brain health to start, uh, like take exercise, for example, uh, committing to say uh, a 10 minute walk every day after lunch. Um, or, you know, if you normally watch 
TV after dinner, even, even just doing some, some stretches or light aerobics is better than sitting on the couch. Even you can do that while you, you watch TV um, or, or take nutrition, uh, consider, you know, swapping in maybe just, just one serving of vegetables to your meal. So again, really kind of small steps to begin with. No, no need to completely uh, upend your life. Um, I would also encourage folks to involve friends, family members. Uh, that's been a big, big theme running throughout this webinar. You know, having that support network um, can really help you stay motivated um, and on track. Okay, um, I'm seeing another question. Um, Don, I think this one is for you. Is there mm -hmm. a website to find out the list of the local memory cafes? So there is. There's a, a website called memorycafedirectory.com. That your local council on aging also knows how to contact uh, memory cafes. The Alzheimer's Association can also direct you to local memory cafes. Okay, um, Donna, another one for you. You mentioned caregiver support groups and the Savvy Caregivers course. I'm a volunteer facilitator with the Alzheimer's Association. Does your program collaborate with the association to locate these services? So I'm so glad that you're volunteering with the Alzheimer's Association, terrific organization. So yes, uh, I would contact the, um, the Alzheimer's Associ Association, their local um, co care consultant would know some of the, the resources that are more local, how to access the Savvy Caregiver Program. They may connect you to the Family Caregiver Specialist directly, um, for the most specific resources for your local community. There's also um, a website called Health, Healthy Living Center of Excellence that offers classes, uh, matter of balance, not just specific to Alzheimer's, but for anyone over the age of 60. Okay, thank you. I think that's about all that I see. Does anyone else care? Do you see any more questions? I think there was one more question about how do you tell the difference between um, normal aging versus uh, and memory loss versus Alzheimer's? Stephanie, can you take that one? Yeah, I can try. Um, so I describe ordinary memory loss as, you know, you've put your keys somewhere. You can't remember at the moment where they are, but it comes back to you. Um, or maybe you don't have, you know, perfect recall of a name. But if you think about it for a second, it'll come back to you. So that's a memory issue um, that could be taught, caused by your, you know, you're tired, you're stressed, you're overworked. Um, maybe one of your medications is causing you to be a little sleepy in the brain. A memory loss is really something where you um, cannot do or cannot recall something that you do very routinely. For example, um, I went to the grocery store. I go here, you know, several times a week. I can't remember where the bread is. Same exact store I always go to. I always get it from the same place. Can't remember. Um, I'm on my way to church and I can't remember the last turn I need to take. And that's not a memory that you necessarily recall or it takes a long time for you to come, come back to it. It's literally a loss of a memory. Um, so anywhere between those two points, you know, and then you're just your gut. Like, do you feel uncomfortable? How frustrated do you feel? You know, you'll know, I think when it first starts, whether this is something that's more temporary versus something that uh, feels like something's wrong with me, you know, and then ask your family and friends too, because they may be seeing, I often say the worst thing I think a doctor can do and many do is, is to say, so how's your memory? Well, you don't remember what you don't remember, Right. So you often need other family members to ask, you know, how do you think my memory's memory? Have you seen anything? You know, do you think I'm repeating things a lot? Um, so ask your outside close friends if they've noticed anything about your memory because maybe you're concerned about something. Thank you. Um, this has been such a rich and rewarding experience and program. So I want to first give thanks to our panelists for sharing this all of this important information with us and for um, helping us to care for our loved ones, ourselves, and for each other. Uh, before closing, I also want to share information on where you can access additional resources and res support. AARP has a vast library of resources available at aarp.org forward slash caregiving. 
There you will find the AARP Caregiving Resource Center with its array of articles and tools to help you navigate your role as a caregiver. Check back often as the center is always adding new resources. For example, we've just added a new caregiving guide for veterans and their families and a financial workbook for military caregivers. You will also find at the Resource Center, ARP's Prepare to Care Guide, a comprehensive guide that includes information as how to have those vital conversations with your loved ones and family members, ways to access your loved one's needs, tips for organizing important documents, a roundup of federal and national resources, tips for caring for yourself, and a host of checklists, medication cards, charts, contacts, and other information. And also, as you've heard, as you've heard from Donna, you can also reach out to Mass Options at 1-800-243-4638. And don't forget the Alzheimer's Association Family Conference on March 4th for those living with dementia and on March 5th, specific for caregivers. You can call 1-800-272-3900 to register. We hope that you have benefited from today's program and we thank you for joining us. If you have questions that were not answered today or have new ones, please send them to masscaregivers at mass.gov. Again, masscaregivers at mass.gov. Stay well and have a great afternoon. Thank you for being with us.